next speaker is on a quest for materials for renewable energy applications. He holds a PhD in applied physics from the University of South Florida. He has received an outstanding dissertation award from USF for his thesis on synthesis and characterization of materials relevant for renewable energy applications. He was a Carnegie postdoctoral fellow at the Carnegie Institute for Science in Washington, DC, where he was exploring high pressure synthesis approaches for the synthesis of materials that could not be obtained employing conventional methodologies. He's currently enrolled in the MS program here at Oregon Tech, and as well as an adjunct instructor for material science here at the school. In addition to investigating alternative methods to interactively and effectively teach physics and material science, his interests are in combining science and engineering in search for materials for renewable energy, such as photovoltaics, thermoelectrics, and magnetocalorics. Stefan is the author of 19 peer-reviewed journals and author, co-author of two books. Please welcome Stefan Stefan. <coughs> for your kind introduction. Good morning, everybody. What a beautiful crowd we have today. Uh, at the beginning, allow me to thank the organizers for inviting me here this morning, and I would like to thank you for being here with us today. Uh, again, the topic of my talk is the quest for materials for renewable energy applications. I wanted to give you a little bit of background, but since Tyler already did that, I'm going to skip that part, and I'm going to get to the main question here this morning which is why are materials important in the context of renewable energy applications? Now, whether we talk about solar, sorry, whether we talk about solar uh, cell technology or wind power or any other renewable energy resource out there, the common denominator for all of them is materials. Those materials can be silicon and solar panels for residential or industrial applications. They can be composite materials for wind turbines. They can be gallium arsenide for uh, these high-tech toys, let's call them, like the Mars rover here. They can be anything but the common denominator, again, and the major point is that every technologically important application starts with uh, materials. My talk here is going to be focused on two aspects, solar cell technology and thermoelectricity because of my background and because of my uh, interests. Let's start with the solar cell technology. What is important? What is the challenge in solar cell technology nowadays? Finding a material that is a good solar absorber and a material that has high efficiency in solar to electrical energy conversion. I'm going to introduce you to one such material which we call it the new allotrope of silicon or silicon 24 which I was able to synthesize it during my postdoctoral fellowship at the Carnegie Institution for Science in DC. And here you can see an artistic uh, sketch of uh, the material indicating its open structure, uh, crystal structure, having this light passing through which symbolizes the potential for uh, renewable energy applications. The way we synthesized this material was applying high pressure methodology with this multi anvil press. And basically, we started with a mixture of sodium silicon in 1 to 6 ratio, and we squeezed it at high pressure of about 8 GPA. This is a pressure which is about 35 times less than that in the center of the Earth, and brought, brought it to a temperature of about 800 degrees, and we observed miracle happening. When I say miracle, that is we have obtained this material, which is a combination of sodium atoms filling these linear empty chains, uh, or channels, I'm sorry, built by silicon uh, atoms. And if we bring this material to a temperature of about 400 Kelvin, because of the volatility of sodium and its high, it is high uh, vapor pressure, we can completely remove it and end up <coughs> with an exclusively silicon framework that we call it silicon 24 due to stoichiometry consideration. Now, what is important about this material? Well, let's take a look at the absorption property as a function of energy, which we measured in a laboratory. You can see that in the visible range of the spectrum, this material has higher efficiency than conventional uh, silicon. Another important aspect of this material is that it's a quasi-direct band gap material. 
what, uh, what does that mean? Silicon, for example, regular silicon or diamond silicon or conventional silicon is an indirect band gap uh, silicon, which means that wafers have to be relatively thick in order to achieve relatively good conversion. This material has direct and indirect band gap that are almost the same. That's why we call it an almost direct band gap semiconductor. Therefore, we can go with relatively low thicknesses uh, with this material. I can tell you one other information, and that is that the band gap of this material is 1.3 electron volts. Now that, to some, might sound nothing interesting, but to some, might sound something astonishing, because if we take a look at the efficiency as a function of the band gap, the maximum of the solar spectrum appears exactly at 1.3 electron volts. That's the so-called Shockley-Quiser limit for an ideal solar absorber. So if you're looking for an ideal solar absorber, you need to have a band gap of about 1.3 electron volt, and that is exactly what this new electrode has. And this story will be almost perfect if there isn't that but, comma, and the thing is that we are at the present moment able to make only small quantities of these materials, milligrams. And if we want to sell it to the industry and replace the conventional silicon, we need to make kilograms or tons even of this material. Currently, there are efforts underway to scale up the process in which I'm also involved, and hopefully it's going to be soon when we see this material scaled up and replacing the conventional silicon digit. Because if you can see, the efficiency is much higher than that of conventional silicon used nowadays in uh, renewable energy applications. Let me now bring you to a different subject, uh, and that is uh, thermoelectricity. When I talk about thermoelectricity, the word itself explains that I'm talking about thermal to electrical energy conversion. It can be realized through two different effects. One we call a Seebeck effect, and the other one we call Peltier effect. Thermoelectric heating or cooling, which can be done when you apply heat source on one end, what you have is basically a thermocouple or a couple of two dissimilar metals, one P, one N, and if we apply heat on one end, the charge carriers, either N or P, are going to try to move away from that heat, and they're going to pile up at the other side, therefore effectively creating a negative charge, for example, on this end, and a deficiency of negative charge on the other end, or in other words, we have creation of electric field. The thermal gradient across this thermocouple has generated electricity. That's what we call Seebeck effect. The other, the reverse effect is also valid, which means that if we run current through this uh, thermocouple, we can achieve heating on one end and heat absorption on the other end. We can combine these thermocouples in a larger system, which we call it a thermoelectric modulus or thermoelectric generator, and we can use it for practical uh, application in terms of heat generation or cooling uh, applications. The efficiency of this thermoelectric generator is assessed via the dimensionless figure of merit called ZT, which is dependent on the Seebeck coefficient, the electrical conductivity, and the thermal conductivity. Introduction of temperature is only to make this parameter dimensionless. And the efficiency of the thermoelectric generator is dependent on that ZT. The higher the ZT is, the higher the efficiency is. Here we can notice that this is just the Carnot efficiency and this is a result of irreversible processes, but the common conclusion is that if we need high ZT value and high efficiency in thermal to electrical conversion, we need high Seebeck coefficient, which means we need large voltage generated per unit of temperature difference, we need good electrical conductivity, these charge carriers have to be able to move freely in our semiconductors, and we need low thermal conductivity, which means we need to maintain the thermal gradient. We don't want the heat to be dissipated or the charge carriers just, just to travel to the other end and the effect to be uh, terminated. What is the application of this uh, thermoelectricity? One of the prospective markets is the automotive market, where we consider these materials for automotive application. Let's look at this figure here, and let's think about the gasoline we are putting in our car. Let's think about it in terms of energy or dollars, depending whether you're science or business major. Only 25% of the energy we put in our automobile goes for driving the car. 40% is wasted through the exhaust gas. Now the question comes, what if we can take these exhaust 
heat and convert it into something useful like electricity. Well, we can do that. At least GM, Toyota, BMW, or wide range of companies are currently working on this, where they employ these thermoelectric generators or thermoelectric moduli. They place them here, like the suburban model from GM shown in this figure here. Using thermoelectric materials, such as the bismuth telluride, they can convert the exhaust heat into electricity and use that electricity where it's necessary, for example, providing air conditioning in the vehicle. This results in reducing the fuel consumption of uh, vehicles. The current state of art uh, number is about 10% fuel uh, <laughs> consumption reduction, and there is uh, potential for that um, number to increase as there is a lot of effort, a lot of research currently going on in this, uh, in this field. Another very niche, very interesting application is for providing power to deep space probe, uh, probes such as the Voyager or Cassini here. Now these space probes are too far away from the sun to be utilizing sun power to power themselves. What they use is this so-called radioisotope thermoelectric generator or RTGs. RTG is basically a thermoelectric generator that has a radioactive element such as cobalt as a heat source emitting heat constantly which can be trapped by the thermoelectric materials and converted into electricity supplying power to this uh, satellite. There is a wide range of materials that is currently under investigation when it comes to uh, thermoelectricity. These silicon germanium alloys, for example, are those that are employed in the RTGs. But my focus and my interest is on this particular group of material that is called clathrates. Clathrate, the word clathrate comes from Greek clathratus, which means encaged, trapped. And that would make sense if you take a look at the crystal structure of this material, you will see a three-dimensional sp3 bonded network of silicon atoms creating these cages that can trap atoms or entire molecules even inside these uh, cavities. The clathrates can be synthesized by, via a variety of uh, ways, very well established ones. However, the interest is to find new ways, new alternative ways of making these materials with potential for thermoelectric applications. One such approach that is shown here uh, was successfully applied a few years back by myself and a colleague of mine back, Matt Beekman, who is now professor at OIT, professor of physics at OIT Klamath Falls, and we were able to synthesize these very nice single crystals of so-called type 1 and type 2 uh, clathrates. What is the importance, what is the significance of these materials? Let's take a look at the electronic properties of this material as a function of the sodium content. If you take this material, this has a variable sodium content. We can change the sodium content from fully filled, X24, which is this shown here, to almost empty, or X about equal 3. And as you can see, by tuning the composition of the material, we tune the electronic as well as thermal properties of this material, ultimately tuning the ZT value and finding a maximum ZT value, which is telling us that that material will be or not beneficial for thermologic application. This image here shows the state-of-art clathrate materials in terms of their ZT value. Currently, the ZT is set to about 1.5, and the holy grail in the, uh, in the field of thermoelectricity is ZT of about 3, where the thermoelectricity can take on major uh, mainstream uh, applications out there. Further details of uh, clathrates, including the physics and chemistry of these uh, clathrates, can be found in a book that was just recently published by my former, actually he is the editor of the book, my former uh, PhD advisor, Professor Nolas, where I have authored and co-authored a couple of chapters that talk specifically about clathrates for thermoelectric uh, applications. In addition to synthesize, I just want to mention also that characterization of the materials is important and measuring the uh, physical properties. This, I'm not going to go into details here, just to mention that this is a transport property system that was designed to measure electrical conductivity, thermal conductivity, same co uh, coefficient uh, on materials designed and uh, assembled by uh, students. Very uh, a sophisticated piece of equipment that can measure all of these properties for example, the thermal conductivity by simply measuring the power through the sample and the temperature gradient measured by a thermocouple and so on and 
and so forth. So in conclusion, or in summary, I hope I convinced you that materials are relevant for renewable energy applications because, and there is a heavy uh, R&D currently going on in the field, which means that there is funding to universities and national labs and multiple masters and PhD positions available for students that are interested in this high field, let's call it that way. Uh, Recent, actually not a recent, but within like the last decade, uh, article from the National Academies Press indicated the urgent need that U.S. has in terms of discovery and crystal growth of materials because every technologically, re technologically important application starts with uh, materials. If we just take the photovoltaic field or the solar cell technology as an example, we will see a rapid growth in the field. 65 gigawatts are expected to be installed simply in this 2016. And the field will continue to grow even further if materials that are good absorbers with good solar to electrical energy conversions are available. And one such material with the prospect of replacing conventional silicon was this silicon 24 that I mentioned. And But the thing is that we need scaling up of this process before commercialization and hopefully that day will come anytime soon. With this I would like to wrap up my presentation. Thank you very much for your attention and I would be happy to answer any questions you would have. Yes. Quick question. Uh, so that silicon twenty four would that have applications in space because they have all these solar arrays on space vehicles, and this would be uh, certainly something right. that interesting. Right. Any application you can think of uh, where solar power is, uh, is needed. As uh, Mr. Barry was talking about, uh, it's important to have thin uh, film materials for solar cell applications because that reduces the cost of the devices. Conventional silicon cannot be that candidate because of that indirect band gap, which requires certain thickness, but this doesn't have that problem, which means that we can make thin films of uh, silicon 24 and use it for whatever application we need to be them. Um, how will the efficiency compare to uh, current solar panels? That's a good question. So our conservative estimate at the moment, based on the absorption properties we have, is that uh, we would expect solar panels with efficiencies of about 35% which uh, the current state of art for bulk materials, not thin film, is about, let's say, 25. So that's a pretty, pretty uh, decent increase. Yeah, you know? Well, gallium arsenide is, uh, would be higher, higher efficiency than gallium uh, arsenide. Galli gallium arsenide, if you notice in that picture, is the, when it comes to the, the material that I compared in the graph is doing much better than conventional silicon because it has a band gap of about 1.4 eV. Silicon is about 1.1, so gallium arsenide is much closer to that shockley weiser limit. But this is 1.3, which is exactly the shockley weiser limit for our solar absorber, so it will do much better than that. Uh, Well, the, the, the current barrier, which is the, the, the scaling up process, the mass production. But we have one idea that we have is like Carnegie is uh, specialized in high pressure. That's like the home institution of high pressure out there in the world. They started by making synthetic diamonds back in the days. And they could only make it in small quantities in small mass. But they have scaled up the process using chemical vapor deposition, for example, and nowadays you can grow synthetic diamonds as large as you, have, uh, you, can, you want. So that's the, the idea that we have about this thing. What, what about if we apply CBD and scale up the, uh, the process? So that's the current obstacle in, uh, in, the, in the process making mass quantities. If we can have it available, then there is no reason why not to replace conventional silicon. The technology is the same, the design is the same, everything is the same. You just have absorber that is with, with higher absorption uh, efficiency. Yes. Do you see the thermo technology being able to uh, work off a uh, person's body heat for like wearable technologies? Yes. Yeah. You can uh, buy on the market nowadays uh, thermoelectric watches that use um, Seiko or 
works maybe it was the one that manufactures those. It uses the thermal gradient between the ambient uh, temperature and your body heat, and it operates based on that thermal gradient. It converts it into electricity and powers the watch. The only problem will be if the outside temperature is equal to your body temperature, then it's zero <laughs> thermal gradient, but that will be But yes, yes, there are multiple uh, applications existing and some that are in the public. Well, thank you very much for your time.